everyone, Shelly here. Today we're going to take this black and white photo to a full color portrait. This picture was found on Pexels.com. You can grab your copy there if you want to paint along with me. I'll drop a link in the description below. So the first thing I did was crop the image to my 12 by 12 and then put a vignette on it. Then I dropped in some grid lines on Photoshop to go with my 12 by 12 shaped canvas. Okay, the eyes in this photograph needed to be toned down a little bit. Here they are fully uh, white and then I dropped a little shade on top of it. So you can see here, she looks a little crazy when they're bright white and then better when we tone it down. So be careful when you're picking out photographs. These are the kind of things you want to make adjustments for. So I'm starting the underpainting with just two colors, the Terra Rosa and then the quick drying titanium white. These are both oil paints. I've mixed on the side here on my palette. I just did a string of different values starting with the lightest value at the top and then just coming down to the darkest pure terra rosa color at the very bottom. And I'm just going to paint the black and white image uh, using these values just like you would with any other monochrome or one color oil painting underpainting. I chose the Terra Rosa as my underpainting color because I wanted to add a little bit of flesh tone to the underpainting color. Uh, this is a Caucasian female, so her skin tone is going to be on the lighter pinkish, peachish color um, spectrum depending on the lighting. So we're going to be in charge of that. We're going to choose what kind of light effects that we want to have. But basically I'm going with the uh, pink underpainting color because of the uh, resulting flesh tones that I'm going to be painting in the end. So if you have a black and white photo that you're working from, like the, the last video I did an American Native American Indian, and that skin tone worked perfectly with the white mixture of titanium white and the um, transparent oxide brown. But when in doubt, it's best just to stay on the neutral side of things, so you can't really go wrong with either the transparent oxide brown, especially if it's a little bit darker skin tone, and if it's a more fair skin tone, then go with something like a Terra Rosa. More important than the actual skin tone colors are that you get the likeness of your um, photograph, and you can do that by paying attention to the values. And that's why starting with a monochrome or a one color underpainting works so well. So you can really focus on capturing the likeness, looking at the values and really setting that up. Now it was very important when I chose this photo uh, that there was some good shadows available that was giving me some 3D uh, effects to the face. Now if I had chosen a photograph that was lit from the very front, looked really flat, there was no um, shadow on the side of the nose, no shadow under the chin, no shadow on the side of the face, then it would have been a very difficult painting to really bring to life and give a lot of 3D and volume to the face. Now it can be done if you're an experienced painter and you know how to manipulate the values and the lighting to uh, improve on the 3D effect and really pull out the volume of the face. But if you're newer, then go ahead and make your life easy and select a photograph that has some beautiful shadows already in place. I'm painting in my usual selective start um, style where I have a one-to-one -one measurement of the um, image on my computer screen, which is to the left of my canvas. And then I have my palette over here on the right, which you can see. So if you need to take some measurements using the proportion tool or just using your paintbrush and just make sure that you have the image on the computer screen zoomed in so that your face and features are in the exact same sizing as what you're painting on your canvas. And that's really easy to do if you put those grid marks in and then you put the grid marks on your canvas, then you can measure 
that what you see on the computer screen is exactly the same size grid mark that you have on your canvas. So for instance, if you're using the 12 by 12, that ends up being a four inch square. And if you need to, go ahead and put down um, some charcoal drawing, uh, some initial marks to kind of set the features in place, then go ahead, do it. Um, I'm just kind of using my eye and winging it. And then uh, once I have a feature down, I like to go back and measure and see that I got it right. And if not, then I just go ahead and correct it. And as I'm painting along, I'm constantly pushing and pulling some of the lines, even if it's just slightly. Like I felt like um, both of the eyes were a little bit narrow as far as the height of those two eyes. And I just kept kind of pushing that lower lash line down a little bit further, a little bit further. So try to get the eyes in place before you move on to the nose because the bottom lash line of the eyes is going to help set the position of the nose. I'm really loving the flesh color that I'm getting from this terra rosa and titanium white mixture. I think it's quite beautiful. Now you could even get to the point where your underpainting's done and you just love it the way it is and you want to just keep it. That is totally fine. You can definitely um, appreciate a really well done underpainting as a true piece of art, a completed finished piece of art. But just for the video's sake, we're not going to stop there. We'll definitely be adding the flesh tone, skin tone colors on top of our underpainting. If any of you do go to pexels.com with the link in the description and you grab the image and you paint it, I would love to see it. So make sure that you email it to me. Uh, my contact information is in the description below or you can, uh, um, there's some Instagram and different Facebook and things. However you wanna show me, just show me. I'd love to see it. So it was really good that we toned the whites of the eyes down because it would look really kind of ghostly or strange if you painted the whites of the eyes lighter than the whitest part of the face where it's highlighted along that nose and the upper cheek. Those, the whites of the eyes should be slightly darker than the brightest light area on the face. And then the other thing to notice is that the eye on the left, which is the eye in the shadow, the whites of that eye should be slightly darker than the whites of the eye on the right side of the face. And notice how I'm not painting individual eyelashes. I'm just suggesting them. And when you view the portrait, there's just no need to paint those individual eyelashes unless you're going for an extreme close-up photorealistic painting. Then by all means, paint each eyelash. I prefer the more classical old world uh, look to a portrait. And I even kept glancing over at my Bouguereau master copy that I did of Psyche. If you didn't see that video, you can go back. I'll try to remember to put a link to it up here in the video you're watching. So you could just click on it and watch that. But yes, having master copies around can be helpful when you are doing something like this, where you're painting a black and white photo and you want to take it to a finished color portrait. So having um, the master copy gave me some beautiful flesh tones to kind of aspire to, if you will. And that uh, master copy of Psyche just really had a lot of uh, similar qualities that I was loving in this portrait. So I definitely kept it close by while I was painting. So we've moved into the nose and if you noticed, I started my nose down a little lower than it should be on the face. And for whatever reason, I always seem to do this. <laughs> I know that about myself. So I was constantly looking from that left eye in the shadow to that nostril. Those are two great um, point to point measurements to get correct so that the nose isn't too long. And the other thing that 
alerted me to the fact that the nose was a little too long was I, I could see I needed to have room around that bottom grid line to put in the mouth. And the initial placement of the nose was not going to allow me to have enough room. So then I knew from those two things that I needed to move the nose up, plus the fact that I always seem to do that. Hey, if you're getting some value out of the video, please go ahead and hit that thumbs up button. It really helps the channel to grow. And if you haven't subscribed, you wanna do that and follow along with me on my journey to becoming a master portrait painter. Okay, making yet another <laughs> push upward with the nose. So never feel like um, you have to settle because you've put in some feature. You can always just brush over it, smooth it out, and start again. I really love doing the one color monochrome underpaintings. It really gives me the feeling of sketching. Um, I don't do a lot of sketching. I tend to work more in this manner where I'm always uh, using a paintbrush. Even when I work in charcoal, I tend to use my paintbrush more than the actual charcoal stick. But I definitely feel like this helps to improve your eye-brain uh, coordination where you're trying to see something specific and put it down on paper. Uh, this definitely will help you to improve that process and using the proportion tool or even this open grid um, process is going to help you improve your drawing skills. Also painting with the one color really helps you to focus on making smooth transitions. Uh, the transitions happen when you move from one value to a different values, say lighter to darker. And you want to make those steps towards the darker shadow in small increments. You want to blend but not over blend. So with the selective start technique, you lay down a brush stroke and then your next brush stroke will just overlap the initial brush stroke somewhat or it could lie just beside of it. And you just keep laying down those brush strokes and stepping with a darker value not blending as you move towards the shadow or the darker part. So it's important that you don't just put down a light color and then smear it into or towards the darker area, hoping that the two colors meeting together will create the transition that you want. It, it will give you much better results, especially once you start working with the actual flesh colors if you take individual colored steps to make your transitions. So the transitions are most noticeable in the bigger, broader areas like the cheek and the forehead. Now, as you move into a smaller feature like the mouth or the nose, even the eyes, there are small, minute areas where transitions need to happen. Now, if you paint them well, you're gonna have an awesome portrait, but you can get away with kind of fudging them a little bit. And that's where your brush strokes really matter. And if you're just laying down the right value in the right color, if you're using the color at this point, then putting it in the correct spot is going to help you have that feature read as you wanted it to. The main thing is you just don't want a lot of hard butt up, butted up against each other edges, especially like in the mouth. The way that the upper lip on the left side of the mouth, it just kind of, the shadow area just rolls slightly over into that lighter part of the upper lip. There's not a hard definitive line marking the position between those two different values. It's just very softly transitioning downward into the part of the mouth where it becomes um, 
more in shadow. I grabbed a much bigger brush for the large area with the hair and I'm just kind of looking at the value patterns on the reference photo and kind of following along and just really wanted to make sure that I captured the roll or the curl direction of the hair because I think that's important in capturing the look and feel of this more vintage style uh, portrait. Now don't forget this is an underpainting so we don't need to put in a lot of detail. You just want to mark the different shapes and the different value areas and that way they'll read as the kind of hair curl or hair shape, the volume in the hair that we're trying to capture so that when we go back over it with color we don't have to really think too hard about uh, what color or, or sorry what value needs to be put down as long as the color on your brush matches the value that's already placed down matches the value that's going to help you um, have the same look that your underpainting does you're gonna definitely capture your sitter this way so here's a look at the finished underpainting and now the photograph in the top left is something that I found that I'm just kind of following along color wise. I've got my palette here. I've mixed up some neutrals that are going to work as my flesh tones. Uh, the underpainting's dry to the touch because we used that fast drying titanium white. I mean, I think I painted this probably in about three hours and it was dry in about an hour <laughs> after I finished. So it dries quick. If you're not uh, wanting it to dry quick, then just use regular titanium white and then let it dry overnight and then you can come back in with your color the next day. But I kept everything really neutral and I wanted it to look as if there was a little bit of sunlight hitting her on the right side of the face and then the shadow areas would be warmer with the light areas staying cool. So even though it's like a sunlit face, I'm going to go with the traditional <laughs> cool lights and warm shadows and as long as you stick with that throughout your whole face all the shadows are warm and all the lights are cool everything's going to play out fine now you can reverse that it can be whatever you want it could be warm lights and cool shadows just make sure you stick with it throughout the entire face don't change up keep your shadow temperatures all the same and your light temperatures all the same Now don't be afraid to let a little bit of the underpainting show through. So I kept my flesh colors very neutral because I knew I was going to put them down fairly lightly so that the pinkish colors from the underpainting would shine through a little bit. So I know the two playing together is going to give me the flesh color that I want. But if you put down some brush strokes of your flesh color and you don't like it, the underpainting is dry so you can just wipe it off and start over then just adjust your paint colors on your palette to help you reach the desired color temperature or you that you're looking for and just start again also I did look towards my Bouguereau master copy for some of the flesh colors here as well Bouguereau tends to paint his flushes very light and I didn't want them to be too light. So once we get the flesh laid in and the background goes down, we may need to go back over our dark and lights and adjust based on how it's playing with the background. If you put in a dark background, you may have to darken some of your shadow areas or even your light areas. And if you are happy with a light background, which we already have, then you're probably gonna be set right off the bat.
So here's another look at the colored uh, photograph that I was using as a color reference. And I'm not going to follow it too strictly, but I was mainly looking at it for um, how the lights played against the shadows. There's a lot of warmth through this face, but I thought it was a good reference just to have. This is a, a way you can find an image on the internet or if you have a colored photograph that you want to use as your flesh or skin tone guide, then that can be helpful just so you have a visual of the colors that you're going for. So you may have heard me talk about the zones of the face in some previous videos. So if you remember, the forehead is more the yellow zone while the cheeks and nose are in the pink zone and then moving down to the chin, that's in more of the purple, gray, green, uh, neutral color zone. And I noticed when I was putting down some of my cheek colors that it wasn't quite pink enough, so I just pulled some of that pink color I mixed up for the lips into my flush pile and that made it perfect. I'm keeping my shadow areas with a more thinner, transparent kind of paint while I'm having the light areas of the face with more thick, opaque paint. So I took the eyes to a pretty detailed finish. Now you can build up the level of finish on your portrait to the degree you like. You may want it to be very painterly, almost impressionistic, and that always looks really cool to me. Or you may want to get really detailed with the whole face and finish it all um, to a high degree of finish. That's up to you. It's whatever your kind of style or taste is. And if you don't know, then maybe you need to experiment and try doing a portrait that's more finished and then try doing a portrait that's just more impressionistically done and has a very painterly look to it. Or you can find somewhere in the middle, <laughs> perhaps, that is going to make you happy. But in the end of the day, it has to be something that pleases you because you are the master of your painting. When I started painting the mouth, I was still adjusting the um, shape and position of the mouth a little bit. I just was really struggling with the corners and maybe because she had a slightly open mouth, which I've painted before, didn't seem to be too difficult, but those the corners of her mouth kept giving me a problem. So it's okay to adjust your features when you start putting down the flesh color. Okay, I've mixed up a sort of neutral dark green color for the background. I really thought it would play nice with the um, Terra Rosa pinkish colors that are in her flesh. <laughs> I'm really loving the red hair effect that's happening. We're going to paint her into a brunette, but I don't know, <laughs> the red hair is looking kind of cool to me as well. And unless you know the person in the black and white photograph, then you could make that call. As the master of your painting, you could decide that the person is going to have red hair or not. So I'm establishing the darker areas of the hair first, and I'm painting those dark areas in with a bit of a transparent oxide brown, so that terra rosa color is definitely gonna shine through in the darker areas, which is gonna give some beautiful luminosity to the portrait. And I'm using a pretty big brush, and so the highlights of the hair are just gonna slightly be painted on top of those darker colors. And then I like to go back over them once I get everything established and it looks like it's in the right place and just kind of pull some of the dark through those highlight areas in the hair. Now there's a bright light shining on the right side here. So this part of the hair is definitely going to illuminate beautifully. That was really what struck me with that initial color photograph image of the girl she had the curly hair and the light was just 
bouncing through that one side and really made a significant difference from the light area of the hair to the dark area of the hair. I thought that was really beautiful. So I wanted to capture that in my portrait. The other thing that I wanted to capture is that reflected light underneath the chin. Now both the girls are wearing white clothing and the white clothing is going to reflect light underneath that chin which you can see in the colored reference photo. So I wanted to make sure I got that and I love doing that. It really helps you to break up that jaw to neck line where the shadow meets the light part of the face. It's never a great idea to have a super hard line there. You want it to be soft, you can break it, you can blur it, um, but then also putting that reflected light on top of the line helps to break it up as well and it helps with the smoother transition too and it's pretty so another way to um, kind of break your line edges is to go over them a little bit with a fan brush now i like to do that and that way it blurs the line but usually when I use the fan brush and I go back in and I put in a little bit more detail. And it's also good if you're having some glare and the lighting is hitting your portrait and you're not able to really differentiate in areas because of the glare, the fan brush can be used to knock down some glare as well. Okay, I'm putting in the headband and I thought it would be a good way to do this is to put in the dark, dark areas of the headband and then go on top of that with the lighter, thick paint that's gonna make that sparkly rhinestone effect. And I like to do these kind of effects with bigger brushes. I, you'd think you'd need like a really small round initially, but the bigger brush you use, I think the better result you're gonna get. But it's something you gotta play around with. So once you have all your colors laid down, then you want to start refining. So this is the point where you decide how much detail, what level of finish do you want to take the portrait to. You can keep working on it and build it up to a high level of finish. And you may even want to let this initial flesh color layer dry and then come back on top of that. So that would be an indirect method of painting. I did mine pretty much um, a la prima, wet into wet with the flesh. I didn't let the flesh color dry and then go back on top of that. I just worked it till I felt it was finished while it was all wet. But it came out pretty good, I feel like. And so here, let me give you a look of the final portrait. And here she is, vintage girl, black and white to color portrait painted in oil. So you guys, if you have any questions about this process, let me know. Happy to answer those. And I appreciate you guys watching and I'll see you in the next one.